Shalom, Vracha, hello, and blessings to everyone, and welcome to Three Opinions, an ongoing conversation about Jewish life, culture, identity, and spirituality, and where we, uh, in good Jewish fashion, wrestle with real and pressing issues of our day so that we can please God get a little smarter, a little more informed, and a little bit more energized to face the uncertainty of this world together. Tonight, I am thrilled to be joined by five amazing women who are on the front lines of organization and mobilization of the Continuous Black and Power Movement. Marshall, Cami, Rebecca, Caitlin, and Joy make up BAM, the Black Activist Mobility Network based here in Metro Detroit, but really in this age of COVID, advancing the fight for dignity, justice, and accountability all over the country through an amazing online presence that shares resources, action items and templates, networking initiatives, and a ton more. So we have so much to talk about tonight, and I want to dive into conversation. But before we do, uh, could you all just introduce yourselves individually and say a little bit about where you are? I think you're all college students, so maybe where you're studying and what you're studying uh, and anything else that we should know about you. And then I want to uh, talk a little bit about the network itself. But for now, I'll let you kind of sort out who goes first and, and I'll let you take it away. We can go in the same order as the last time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Go Let's first. do the same order. <laughs> I can go first. Um, hi everyone. My name is Joy. I go to Michigan State University where I'm studying psychology with a minor in environment and health. Um, something that I want to emphasize this little promo is that my internship per jump, we are doing a get out the vote sequence where we're trying to get more people to apply for absentee ballots so that they can be safe and participate in this democracy during coronavirus time and vote by mail. So make sure to go to the Michigan Secretary of State's office and apply for an absentee ballot. Very cool. Awesome. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Upong. I am a rising sophomore at Howard University. I'm studying uh, my major is biology on a pre-med track, and uh, something that I also want to let people know is to make sure they're registered to vote. I'm a part of the same internship Joy is in for them. So um, yes, make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you um, vote safely this upcoming election because of this whole coronavirus pandemic. And yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I go to Michigan State University. I am majoring in community governance and advocacy with a concentration in psychology on a pre-med track. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful to be here and really excited to share our stories with you. Awesome, thank you, Rebecca. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Cami. I'm a rising sophomore at Northwestern University. Um, I'm majoring in legal studies um, and hoping to double major in sociology on a pre-law track. And I'm also really excited to be here today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> hey, Marcel, sorry for cutting you off, go ahead. Um, I feel like that we're definitely gonna interrupt each other tonight, but we're gonna have fun with it. Um, my name is, I'm, my name is Marcel Parker. I am a rising junior at um, the number one public HBCU, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, where I study political science. Um, however, I am a Michigan native. Um, currently, my internship, like Joy and Caitlin, um, I work for the Michigan AFL CIO. So basically I um, do work to make sure that our representatives are making sure that we're finding economic justice and as well as social justice um, to the Michigan community. So yeah, that's a little bit about me, but I'm very much excited to be here and um, to be interviewing with my sisters with you, Mr. Yanni. I am. So let me say, I'm just so honored to be talking with you all. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about a lot of different things, but this is just so cool. And, and I'm glad that you all agreed. Uh, like I said to you guys a little earlier before, um, before we hopped on, uh, this is relatively new and everyone's trying to figure out um, how to make sure that we're all staying engaged with coronavirus and everything else while some of our community is um, kind of all spread out all over the place. So um, 
so thanks for being here. Thanks for allowing us to learn with you. Uh, and thanks for sharing your story. And uh, I'm excited to just get in and talk about a, a lot of different things tonight. So first and foremost, I want to talk about, about BAM itself and how you all got started. Um, so uh, one of the things about this, is, which is so remarkable to me and so cool, is that, I mean, the network is relatively new, right? You're already um, blowing up my Instagram feed, which I think is just a testament to the amazing work that you all are doing. Uh, and you're what only two and a half months old now three months old something like that so yeah. how did you put this together how did the five of you come together to do this and what was the thought process what was the spark that made you realize that this is something that you had to do mm -hmm. um I feel like we all can speak on this really I remember um for me it kind of started with a FaceTime call with Cami and Rebecca and we were kind of just talking about how we're tired of being complacent in our own communities. And especially like, I think the pandemic really opened up our eyes because not only were we first in our homes and kind of glued to our phones, but like the live streams that we were seeing of um, black lives, unfortunately and brutally being lost at the hands of the police. I think that kind of was um, my call to action. And so when I hopped on the phone with them, we all kind of were in the same mindset. Yeah. yeah, I can see that as well. Uh, how it all started. Um, well, me and Cam, like, I remember us, like, having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, she came over by my house, and we were talking, and I was like, we should do something. Like, we see, like, that we have the positionalities of being in universities. Like, you're law, I'm pre-med. Like, we need to really be advocates. And then I was like, Marcelle, like she's somebody that I know is very involved and then that led to us having a FaceTime call and then um, also then led to me connecting with Caitlin and Joy because I also was in the internship with Perjum. So just combining all of our fronts of being like pre-med, pre-law and just understanding that we have the power to make change in our society and in Detroit, there was the first protest um, that was happening um, in response to the killing of George Floyd. And at that protest, we realized like, we can do this. This is something that we can do. We realized that this is something that we are called to do as advocates, you know, as people that have been active on social media, that have been very vocal um, prior to um, the killing of George Floyd, but to also this, it didn't begin at George Floyd, nor did it stop at George Floyd. There are so many black women and black men that are being killed that, you know, isn't being publicized. So we want to bring awareness to what is going on. We want to bring justice and accountability, um, not only in our communities, but across Michigan and even across the United States um, to what is happening in our communities and how we all play a role. It doesn't matter if you go to a university. It doesn't matter if you're pre-med, pre-law. Like, if you have a voice, if you have a platform, which is social media, you are part of this movement. So it really came to us as mobilizing everyone, mobilizing specifically our Black community and um, making us realize that we have the power to shift the narrative in the way that we want, want it to be. Beautiful. I love that. Um, I, I, you said something important there, which is talking about the mobilization of, of the Black community. Um, but I also want to point out that a lot of your, a lot of, a big part of what you've been doing is, is organizing protests and opportunities to come together to learn, to march, to speak up. Uh, but a big chunk of those initiatives have been in, in pretty white parts of the metro area. So when you set up something like a, a protest or uh, an opportunity to come together. When you do that in Birmingham or Berkeley or Troy, does that require some intention and some mindful planning that looks different than if you were doing it in, in the city in, in Detroit or in Southfield or, or elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it does. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. no um, yes. Okay. Yeah, it definitely required um, intention. We definitely wanted to hit out as suburbs specifically because um, we feel as though this is where um, the majority of Black voices are silent, silenced um, with regards to our education systems, our healthcare systems, and just socially, um, 
lots of black people do not feel comfortable out in these areas where they don't feel as though they have a community behind them to support um, them, especially in times like these where um, law enforcement officials are taking our lives every day, especially even white civilians are taking our lives every day or um, calling the police on us for doing everyday actions in these sorts of communities. So that's why we felt as though it was imperative that we hit out as suburbs. We want all of these people to hear our voices, to know that we are not alone out here, um, that we still have a voice out here, that we won't be silenced, and that um, we just wanna see change everywhere. We wanna be unified in all communities. Anyone else want to add anything to that? Um, I think uh, it's important to be in those communities because um, while the Black voice is silenced in those communities, most of the people who reside there identify as liberal, democratic. So I just feel like um, it's ironic that our voices are silenced out there and those are the political ideologies that the people there have. So it's important to go there kind of spread our message and garner support because those are the people who will support us. I think um, the thing that makes BAM so different is um, we see a lot of critiques from other orgs that like, oh, we need to um, basically like make our message more to like an in-house, outhouse, but instead we kind of went outhouse, in-house. Um, I really think that we did this for the purpose because um, we did all attend um, a Detroit Will Breathe protest together and we saw like um, who was in the crowd, um, how they were acting in the crowd and stuff. And I think really our encouragement was that like, um, why, why, and not saying that the protest in like protesting in Detroit is like looked down upon or anything, but it's like, um, I think our message was really my dog is coming up the stairs. I think our message was really just to um, hit hard on these um, key points and letting them know that we aren't just protesting in a city and we're not just going to uh, like mess up our city or or like destroy our home. We're gonna take it to your home and let us know that knock knock, like black lives still matter and we're still here and we're prevalent in this community too. So it was really just um, the thought process of if we can gain um, allyship in knowing that like the movement is here too and don't let it disappear with you, don't let, um, don't become just a social media ally, you know, um, then that's really what progresses the movement and that's really what we try to do. I love that. And we're gonna, I'm gonna make sure that we end our conversation talking about those action points too because i think that that's going to be really important for just kind of the takeaways of what next right mm -hmm. uh, i also want to make sure that we give a shout out to detroit will breathe since you just mentioned detroit will breathe that um give them a follow uh make sure you're keeping up with them they they have a um a it's hard to say the right adjective i guess a great instagram account but it's also really yeah. hard like i mean it's 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 giving the voice to the protests that are happening, but it's also showing like why these protests are so necessary um, day in and day out every single day. And I know that that's a um, part of my daily news cycle now to make sure that I'm watching them. And if I can't make it to be physically out in the protest to make sure that I'm seeing what's going on in the city and, um, and what's happening because there's been, as you all know, and as most people that are watching know, some, been some really horrific things that have happened as part of those protests, including people getting run over by police cars and um, awful, awful things. So um, follow them. They're a great resource. They're on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm not sure if they're on Facebook or not, but um, yeah, I'm good. not sure about that. But even um, with that, like, I know that um, us as BAM, we, we're big and people think that we're big, bad, and BAM, but we really could not have done it with, like, without some of the collaborations we've done. And we really try to make sure like um, that we try to work with other people, not only to spread our message, but to make sure that we promote unity within our community. And that like, like even though we might have different ways of going about the movement, like we could still all come together at the end of the day. Like um, for example, like our Juneteenth event, we really could not have done that without um, the Black Butterfly Association or Power Detroit. 
And um, with our last protest in Shelby Township, like we really couldn't have done that without the Detroit Solidarity Movement or AMA protests. So we think that it's just as important to, you know, recognize the people who we've been working with and are planning to work with and the people we admire, such as um, Detroit Will Breathe and um, On Your Story, Detroit. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I just want to say too that I think it's just a testament to how great this generation is because it's kind of the, the and we're, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the old guard of some of these movements and in, in different ways are were so territorial that it was like the idea of working together was, I mean, it took meeting after meeting after meeting for people to come together and actually agree on what they could share and what they couldn't share. And I think with, with y'all and, and everything that's happening right now, it's, it's like, it's just a second nature that you should be teaming up with people to uh, make sure that you're amplifying voices and working together because that's the way that the community comes together, right? Um, so that's awesome to see, and I'm and I'm really really excited that that continues to build. And I'm, uh, you know, if we can prop ourselves up a little bit here, I'm glad that you're partnering with us right now to be able to have this conversation because we want to be able to help too. And and it's very very cool. And again, a testament to you guys that to just say yes as quickly as you did to this and. You didn't have demanding questions and you didn't want to know. And I was just like, I can, I can tell you questions. I can tell you all these other, and you're like, no, we're good. We'll just talk, <laughs> um, which is great. I mean, that's how it should be. We're all just trying to um, come together to make this world better, to get some justice and accountability uh, and some peace. And we need to be able to do that by coming together and, and being able to have these conversations. Um, yeah. So I think something important and powerful uh, that this movement and this uh, moment represent is, and this is going to be a little complicated, so I want to try to explain it in the way that makes sense. Yeah, take um, your time. Is the understanding of the weight and significance of history while simultaneously rejecting the anchor to progress that history can sometimes be. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that this moment and this movement feel like a, a spark or uh, a national waking up for a lot of people after 400 plus years of racism that has taken on different guises and different ways of instituting that racism. And so there is an acknowledgement or at least the beginning of an acknowledgement that our history as a country isn't actually the, um, the myths and the revisionist history many of us are taught in school or see portrayed in books and movies and other media. But at the same time, there is built into what is happening and what you all are doing a humility and a forgiveness that allows for progress instead of just anchoring and staying in place and being so angry and demanding answers for the past. You know what I mean? Like that's part of it, but it's also saying we can't just be bogged down. Well, I mean, we have to move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 It's, um, oh, you want to go? Oh, yeah. So I would just say like into like leading that question and just like, talking or just speaking on the fact that like not being bogged down and like realizing that we have to move forward i think we could just all just say like it's time like it's time to come together it's time to band together it's time to um just like you said how a lot of like intersections and how a lot of groups are coming together right now it's because we're tired like i definitely think that millennials and gen z it's like we've seen this we've seen the history like we need this change now like we need to see this change now and i'm actually proud to be a part of like the gen z generation and just like you know working like also along with like the millennials because i feel like our generation we are like that change like that flip that pivotal moment that we're gonna actually start seeing like differences in these systems that were meant to oppress us and because i think that we're not asking anymore and we're demanding and we're being more forceful with it mm -hmm. and so i just think that's like a really big testament to like the history and seeing like we can't we can't keep repeating this like something's got to give something has to change mm -hmm. i think that um like in addition to that like even though we are um it might seem like we're more on this wave of like everything has to end now like i still don't want to um ever like discourage or dismiss like the fight that my ancestors had to put forward because like from 300 years of slavery to a hundred years of sharecropping, to mass incarceration, um, and all these other barriers and systems, I really feel like um, 
that the thing that Generation Z recognizes is that all these issues are bigger than us. And mm -hmm. like one of our pillars, especially is like um, spreading intersectionalist ideologies. So we definitely want people to notice that like um, being black and being a black woman and being an educated black woman puts various targets on my back. But I also recognize that I am privileged in the sense like I got to attend private school for high school. Like a lot of people don't get that opportunity. So I think um, Gen Z recognizes not only their privilege, but I think they're more willing to check um, everyone else's privilege. And I will also say that like BAM itself, I feel like um, our movement works to kind of fight our ancestors battles that unfortunately like some of them won and some of them lost at the same time so i think that um yeah i, I really feel like we're just continuing the same fight from the 60s honestly like it might have lost momentum but we're back now it's just called a different name so but i do want to i do want to say though that i think there is something different about it because of the intersectionality that you were talking about yeah that feels like um and I think this is kind of goes to what I was saying earlier about how that, that partnership was so difficult for people uh, and the trust was building, building up over a long, long, long amounts of time. Um, so a lot of people were fighting their own fights by themselves, right? The civil rights movement was, was taking place with mainly black Americans and very few people that were outside of the black community. Um, we Jews had a, a great presence in the civil rights movement. We were still a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the civil rights movement, right? right. It was people looking up for for their own movements and and the and the uh, ideas of justice that every group was trying to attain. But like you were saying, you were also pointing out the ideas of of fighting for black empowerment, but also fighting a fight of feminism and fighting a fight of. Uh, and I know that you guys did a. a um, you were at Pride and did a protest and, and, a, and a march at Pride too, mm -hmm. where you're reaching out to other groups who are also fighting fights, right? And all of that intersectionality is saying exactly what you said, Marshall, saying we enough with like trying to say, we'll pit each other against one another or to right. ignore the plights of some people because of what we need to face right now. And it's saying like, we're all, we're all fighting the fight that is an, a big fight, which is equality right and justice for people i feel like at the end of the day like um most of these issues come down to human rights issues and mm -hmm. that's why it's um bam's fight to combat you know because we are an intersectionalist group so all these issues really just become our fight um to battle too i remember um I was in one of my um, black politics classes for school and we watched this one documentary on the Black Panthers movement and a lot of women in the Black Panthers movement said that um, they weren't really worried too much about like feminism or womanism and things of that nature because they realized that they had to fight for their skin color before they fought for their own like sexuality and their own womanism in a sense. So I think um, that's that's again like how you said how we're the same but we're also different and um to our viewers real fast i'll let my sisters share because i feel like i just be yapping at the mouth <laughs> but um intersectionality is defined on the dictionary as the interconnected nature of social cate categorization such as race class and gender as they apply to the given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage so just to throw the definition out there for those who is confused out there. No, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I want to make sure that everyone else is, is so I want to make sure if anyone else has anything to say on that, feel free. Um, I would say like Marshall covered like a great, a broad spectrum of it and gave a really good explanation for it. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything they would want to say about it. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So, um, I also want to I also want to talk about the we we've been talking a little bit about um, millennials and Gen Z and how this changes a little bit with the idea of these generations coming together, uh, and I think that that's notable. But I think the reason that this feels different and what makes this notable is because. Uh, there's a future-oriented ethos of millennials and Gen Zers. It changes the conversation to 
action rather than to talk. And I think for as much as millennials and the Gen Z uh, generations uh, get so much, trying not to say any profanity on the show, um, <laughs> but for, for lack of a better word, just for, we get shit on so much um, for being the apathetic generations or for the generations that are called the snowflakes and the whatever, and we're too sensitive and we're everything else. But built into that is also the, the idea of like, no, we're sensitive to these things and we want to talk about these things because these are real issues that are taking place and hurting people. And instead of just saying that, oh, it's okay, it's just built into the fabric of our country or the fabric of society, to be able to actually get out there and change something and to do something about it, I think speaks in a way that, that a lot of the generations before just really didn't have the opportunity or... or thought was even possible. So I was hoping that some of you could um, kind of talk about that hope that comes built into that, to not just say the world is broken and we're gonna leave it broken because it just is always gonna be that way, but to say, no, we, we have the power to make change. And even if that fight is a gigantic fight, how are we gonna make sure that that fight is still one that we are undertaking and fighting every day? Yeah, I can add to that. It, it really just comes down to us redefining what one freedom looks like what equality looks like and overarchingly what does america look like so it comes to us taking a step back acknowledging our history acknowledging these plights acknowledging what our ancestors have done acknowledging the civil rights movement all of these movements that have created what we see here in 2020 and it comes to really just redefining how should we move? How should we navigate? How should we use our positions? How should we use these resources that we have? It is amazing that we can have a Zoom conversation in the middle of a pandemic. Right. To talk about civil rights, to talk about equality, to talk about progression. So it's just these resources and these tools that really push forth that hope and that educate us further and not only educate us as people on the front lines, but also educate people that have been socialized to feel as if they can't do anything. I feel like with BAM, we are really changing the narrative that you have to be a certain type of way to do something about the hate that is ingrained into this country. Um, it really comes to us reinventing um, how we're moving, how we're navigating. Yeah. And it, it's really just it's so many ways to protest. It's so many ways to take action. It's so many ways um, to bring about change. And it doesn't have to be limited to a box. You know, it's just, we really just want to extend the conversation, extend the action items, um, extend the work that we're doing beyond, you know, who's known to be like the activist or who's like, who fits into that box. Because we just want people to realize regardless of where you come from, regardless of who you identify, that is important, but you are important to contribute to what, what we're doing and what this movement is all about. Yeah, beautifully stated. And, and if I can push you on that a little bit more, Rebecca, so you specifically, individually, who you are, what gives you hope every day? What makes you actively part of this that makes you sign on to the Zoom call or go down to Shelby Township earlier this week? I say what gives me hope is the the future. It, what we're doing today is for the future. So when I wake up, I'm like, okay, I have a voice. I have to get even more spiritual. Like God has given me, you know, the position, the voice, the action to do certain things, the hope, like the gusto, like it's just being motivated to see that there is an, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So it's just realizing that light. It's realizing where we've come from. Realizing that we have so much strength. It's so many things we can do in 24 hours, you know, and it all depends on how we use it and what our intention is and what we're focusing on. If we put our focus on, I want equality. I want to end mass incarceration. I want to end the school to prison pipeline. I want to end inequity in housing. I want to end inequity in access to water. God will redirect your footsteps to open those doors. 
to get there. And it really just comes to focusing our mind and focusing our energy on what the end goal is. And that's really what wakes me up in the morning. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. I you really gave me, you gave me chills there. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just interrupted someone. No, that was really good, Rebecca. Like, I really liked on how you were hitting, like, just as much as it's, like, a mindful movement mm -hmm. as well as, like, a human rights. Um, Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, physical, it, spiritual, mental, all that. So. It, like, our generation so innovative and resourceful. We took a pandemic, and who would have thought that three, four months, or at first two, three months trapped in the house would have led to the exposure of unfortunately another black dead but we were able to take that and spark a whole new movement like we saw our generation being super active in march for our lives but this time around this movement is centered around a black issue and it's led by young black women which is amazing to see um even since the beginning of time black women frequently kick-started movements but they were so overshadowed today allows us to use our social media um, and our hyper-connectivity today to just keep spreading awareness. No, I think you're right on, Cami. I think that that is, again, a testament to not just you guys, but to also to the generation that's out in the streets right now and, and raising their voices because out of any time for there to be this important wake-up call of a movement, the odds are so stacked against everyone when it's during a global pandemic, when people are shut in their homes and yet here we are, you know, and, and that's powerful and that's beautiful. And I also wanted to say uh, um, to what Rebecca was talking about too, in, in this way of there's kind of the spiritual sense that comes along with this. Um, one of my great heroes and one of my, the people that motivates me and gives me my hope every morning and helps me get out of bed and, and continue working as a rabbi is uh, a, a rabbi who was named Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was very active in the civil rights movement and was good friends with Martin Luther King Jr. And they marched together from Selma to Montgomery. And uh, he spoke of, of, of Martin Luther King Jr. as a prophet. And when they walk together when they march together from Selma to Montgomery uh, an interviewer went to Heschel and asked him you know you're a, a Jew and a rabbi why are you here what's making you what's motivating this walk that you're doing right now and he responded by saying because it feels like my legs are praying which I think is just like the most beautiful way of talking about what the movement is right and about what human dignity is and about what empowerment is and what it means to support one another yeah. and to care about the plight of one another because it is i think it's praying i think it's praying with our legs and i think when we're going out into the streets and and fighting for justice that's prayer and it's the same way that we pray if we're in in church or mosque or synagogue or wherever it might be but it's also a prayer that's saying like there's a, a an overarching prayer that bonds every single one of us most most definitely like um, going to Catholic school, especially um, identifying as um, a Baptist Christian myself, um, I think I really just like realized, and especially in my religion classes, that like the overarching message is just to like love your neighbor and treat people how you want to be treated at the end of the day. And I really feel like those are um, values and virtues that regardless of your religious affiliation, we all can uphold to... Um, make this world better. For sure. And I think that one of the things that's so antithetical to a lot of people who are people of religion is that they use their religion as a way of weaponizing against other people yeah. instead of actually building and helping, right? I, listen, yesterday, I'm, well, whenever we had the Shelby uh, Township protester, um, I mean, protest, um, it was actually very interesting because usually during our protests, we're not necessarily met with counter protesters. Um, if they are, our biggest counter protesters would be the police. But um, yesterday, it was really like hands on and um, really like in your face, blatant racism hate. and um, yeah, blatant hate. And like at some moments, we did get to actually like talk to some of them and stuff. And like, for example, like, um, it was one demonstration where we kind of shut down the streets in Shelby. Um, and 
uh, one, they would yell back at us, like, all lives matter, you're out here for no reason. Flip and we would off. respond back, yeah, like, we would respond back, like, if all lives matter, you would be out here with us. Like, if you, if you, if you even can consider, like, um, raving your American flag in my face, why is that seen as a, as a hate towards me? Like, shouldn't, don't we all live here? Aren't we all together? So it's just very interesting how, like, counter movements use the message of love but can twist it in such a way to where it's um excluding like my community your community like communities all over the place so i think that's why um bam really like um practices not like spreading hate and always combating hate with love like if they say all lives matter we just yell louder that black lives matter. matter so we have a sign that says stop pretending your patriotism is uh, no stop pretending yeah oh wait is it stop pretending your patriotism wait someone else say it because I, yeah, I know i know exactly what sign you're talking about that we have <laughs> i was holding it yesterday i think it's like um it's like stop pretending your racism isn't patriot or is patriotism yeah like, stop pretending your racism is patriotism okay yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and, and that just goes to show, like, when we look at American history and we look at American ideals, we say liberty, we say justice for all, we say all these things, but we have to acknowledge who is the all that was intended when those words were proclaimed. You know, it wasn't the Black woman, it wasn't the Black man, it wasn't um, BIPOC, it was the it wasn't white, white women. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't even white women. Like, it wasn't so. Even all white men. And. All white men, so. So it's really just looking at how history has what has what history has put in stone for us and how we're redefining it and how we are claiming the country that we have made, all of us have made. And it's just interesting when, you know, we say liberty, but how can you say, how can you proclaim liberty but then show hate? Yeah. It's counterintuitive. Like it's exactly the opposite of what you're talking about so it's really just making people realize like come on now like you say this but it really you are not even talking about liberty for you're not even talking about justice you're going against the american ideals that are put into place and it's really just saying like look at look at this look at yourself look in the mirror you know i think a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the words right mm -hmm. and which is good in some way like words are powerful and words are right, carry a lot of weight with them but people use them as fallbacks to say no listen we, we can't be racist as a nation or we can't be prejudiced as a nation because we've said liberty and justice for all and if it's written in our books and if it's written in our uh, constitution and declaration of independence then it must be there for a reason right and then we have to respond by saying it's great that maybe these things said something but let's look at the reality on the ground of how that history is actually played out and let's talk about if we're living up to our ideals about what those things are written right and if we can say listen going back in american history i feel okay with that we've lived up to those ideals i don't think that's an honest conversation then i think if we're if we're not um identifying the ways that we have let down the people in this country especially people who are in this country who are in this country by no request of their own but were taken to this country exactly and i was actually um like on the same on the same like idea um it it really reveals the erasure of black history and the erasure of just history in general in this country because i was having a conversation with one of the uh counter protesters and he was telling me that it's a blessing that African peoples um, and Caribbean peoples were brought here by slave shit because we were given the opportunity to read, write, and learn and be here. And it's just like the narrative of just African peoples being barbaric and violent savages the is so white crazy. Savior. The white savior complex. It's just so crazy because I mean, we were really doing our thing and it's just like, what kind of savages were the Vikings or, I mean. I, I, think, I think it really yeah. goes back to like how BAM is kind of like 
making it a point to make sure that we educate as much as like we make our presence known mm -hmm. because like it's really interesting how like um i remember talking to another one and he really was like slavery ended after the 1964 civil rights act it's all over and i'm like sir if you knew like how hard it was for me like to to even just do the simple things that you see as a luxury oh if only like you could step in my shoes so I think um, it's very much the education. And as we were talking with um, the Metro Detroit Equity Fellows, like about our um, our history books and how even like um, they're framed and how like, um, even though like our, our founding fathers are here nor there, how they're necessarily like framed in a way that erases all the, all the bad things that they did and highlighted as good. So I think that it definitely goes on to uh, educating yourself, educating your community, and um, making sure to stay enlightened because I feel like, honestly, I've learned more on my Twitter timeline, maybe my Gen Z is coming out. I feel like I've learned more on my Twitter timeline, even just fact checking that stuff, than I have in like my actual like AP classes and textbooks and stuff. Right. Yeah, and just referring back to Cam's point, I do agree with the um, negative stigma related to like Africans and Caribbeans being brought here and like being blessed with the chance to like learn because growing up in a Nigerian household, even going to school in suburban communities, I was always taught like, oh, Africa was this empty, hollow, um, savage filled land that didn't have That's anything, funny. but my mom took me to Nigeria and you're seeing mansions, you're seeing big cars, you're seeing educated people, you're That's seeing political funny. structures and cultural structures. And you're like, wait a minute, this is not what I'm taught in school. And, and that's the problem that we have. Food. You're not yeah. seeing this processed food. The land yeah, is total. Let's or go. even, oh my gosh, you want to know what blows me? Like, um, what's the name? When I would, at my high school, I'm not going to say which high school, but at my high school, like, girls would um, come back from their mission trips. Mm. And, like, they would be like, I loved helping out those kids in okay. Africa or or the neat or the or the malnourished black and brown children like look at me with them look at and it's like if the roles were reversed and I went over to somewhere very very poor in, in Europe and was like oh look at these little starving white kids aren't they so cute I helped them out so much you will look at me funny you know so it's, it's like just how Caitlin is saying it's, it's it, it all goes along with that yeah, and I can, like, also say that that representation is really important because just like how Caitlin was saying, how, like, in the textbooks or just, like, even in class, they'll describe, like, parts of Africa as, like, deserted, like, very, like, impoverished and stuff like that, like, but for they'll me, talk about our resources. Right, and it's just, like, for me growing up as a Black child, like, I didn't know that Africa like how beautiful Africa really is and like the actual beauty that is in Africa until I got older and I started doing my own research because in these elementary schools and these middle schools you learn as a black child that like no like Africa's impoverished Africa like you know all these like bad stigmas around it and you don't really learn like the beauty of it until you get older and decide to do your own research so I think that also like really damages a lot of like black kids mindsets of just like the history and where you really come from. Yeah, and that's why, like, overarching, like, the point I was trying to make was that we need to, like, hit out at these um, systems that control the mindset of the youth. Like, racism is not, you're not born being racist, you're taught it, right? So the education systems that you go into, your workplace, these are where you really learn um, how you view society, how you view different cultures. So if you're being taught as a young kid that somewhere that you originated from is nothing, then you're gonna grow up thinking that you have to be a certain standard. You have to fit the European standard when that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So it even goes into like Grace, you know, the girl named Grace who was um, arrested for not doing her homework, yeah. black kids being held to a different standard than white kids and all of these suburban and um, Detroit cool. communities, yes. They're not, um, they're not as respected. They're not given the opportunity. They're not given the chances to grow. And 
that's why people are protesting. That's one of the reasons, because these educational systems play such a large role in our perception of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I really think, like, just to hit on that last point that you made, Kaylin, about, like, why people are protesting, like, I really think if you ask anyone in our crowd or even any one of us, like we're never just protesting for one reason. Like in Shelby, we might've had like the one reason of how we wanted um, Chief Shalid removed, but the, the still the overarching reasons were like police brutality, like um, injustice. Um, even one of our demands talked about like coercing um, detainees for consensual sex acts. Um, and these are just like topics people don't think about. Like, for example, like um, at our Troy March and our Birmingham March, I feel just as well as people were marching for black lives, people were um, marching for like housing disparities and um, like how in Detroit they're trying to get their water shut off or the upcoming eviction since the pandemic is apparently over. Like, um, I feel like everybody kind of has their reasons as to why they're fed up and, um, because I feel like because people see um, black people as necessarily the people that deal with all of these problems on um, an unequal amount of basis, the Black Lives Matter movement is kind of the movement for everyone to just join in and share their grievances because they know we've been dealing with them. So. And I think that, and, and I just want to respond to that quickly because I think the, the part that probably makes me the most frustrated is that there's counter protesters trying to tell you or, or people in general and, and I know that people could be watching whatever they're watching and, and already wanting to respond with okay but or yeah. let me tell you this and it's like but maybe at this moment and maybe at most moments in general we should get ourselves comfortable with the idea of listening to what's hurting people and we should even even if we might want to say something like the, the most basic idea of human empathy and communication instead of trying to think about what you're going to say next, it's just like really sit with someone and listen to what they're saying and try to figure out what that means. And especially if it's coming from someone whose skin color is different or sexuality is different or gender is different or uh, their economic status is different because by definition, you, you wouldn't know what that person is experiencing unless they tell you and unless you really listen. Yeah. Right? So I, go ahead. No, you can keep going. No, no, no. Go ahead, Joy. I, I'm, I'm a rabbi. We talk too much. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would just want to say, like, to really go off of what you just said, one thing that I really realized, um, just like being in Shelby and like dealing with the anti-protesters, was that they were not willing, to, they were stuck in their own complex of yeah. like, like like i don't think it would be even be possible to sit down and have like an intelligent conversation with them because yeah. at the end of the day they're still stuck in their own complex of all lives matter um like make america great again like that whole like realm and it's just like it's clouding your judgment and it's like not letting you see the real story like they think we're trying to say like oh like um like f america like all this other stuff and it's like i feel like that's the exact reason why they're combating it with like bringing out their american flags and like yeah. all that other kind of stuff and it's just like you guys aren't really listening to the real reasons why we're out here protesting like and then i heard someone say one of the protesters said are you guys protesting black lives or are you protesting police brutality pick one it's just like you really don't get it, do you? Like, and you're not even taking the time to get it. Like, that's the part that's really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, you were gonna say something. So sorry, boy, but I was gonna say uh, some people were even saying, so white lives don't matter. And yeah, you know, just, like white lives matter. Exactly. That just goes to show that ignorance is bliss. You really can't be mad at people for staying stuck in ignorance because um, one, they're privileged enough to not mm -hmm. even have to deal with stuff like that. But it's so much easier to ignore it and counter it with all lives matter and make it about your. It's so much easier to be selfish than take ownership for what you and your ancestors did and are still doing. Yeah. So can't really be mad at them. Just got to pray that they do better in life. I will say that um, with one of the counter protesters I talked to, um, I did feel like in a way, I kind of reached a break point with him because um, he was kind of giving me his all lives matter spiel or whatever. And I was like, 
Well, I under I think that um, our movement, we never negate that all lives matter, right? We're just saying that Black Lives Matter is a priority. So to him, I kind of explained it. Think of it as like hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter too, like a parentheses and a T-O-O, because it's like, um, the two is not important. <laughs> the two definitely defers the message, but the Black Lives Matter too, it just lets you know that you also matter, you are also included, but just focus in on the Black lives and the Black stories and um, the Black pain that we're trying to illustrate to you um, to where we feel like our life doesn't matter and how you as an all lifer should recognize that I feel like my life does not matter and how can we change this um, together and that actually shut him up real good he sat there he was like this and I was like hmm but yeah and that's big I mean that's that's a win right because you again at the end of the day and which is what I love about your message that you guys have is that it's about love and it's about making sure that we're coming together and it's not like oh we need to fight back against these people who are so um, unwilling to listen to us. It's like, let's talk. And maybe, maybe if I can just sleep, like squeeze a, a toe into the door, mm-hmm. maybe there's something that will stick with that person to make them think in a little bit of a different way. Um, but I want to, I want to also echo what you were saying, Cami, which is just that idea of it's so much easier to hear something, or especially if it involves the country that you're living in or anything that where you might've had a role, even if you didn't have an intentional role, right? Like as someone who's a white passing Jewish guy who could be a white guy easily on the street by just yeah. taking off my kippah and no one would ever know that I'm Jewish, right? Is to say how much easier my life is because of that. And then to say like, it, which doesn't mean that my life is easy by any means. It just means that it's not hard in the same way that other people have to deal with those different things. And instead of saying, oh, if they're struggling, why are they mad at me or why are they upset with it's it's not about you like it's just listen like it doesn't have to always just be about you and if we can get to a point where we're saying the people that we're talking to even if we've never met them before right this is the first time that that the six of us are meeting and like it's 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 about taking care of one another and becoming friends and having those conversations because you're what happens to you necessarily affects me right I want you to be happy so I can be happy. I want you to be healthy and, and treated well, because if you're not, that means that someone else is also not. And if someone else is also not, that means someone else is also not. And down the, down the line, ad infinitum until it just means that all of us are just um, suspicious of one another and um, feeling threatened by one another instead of realizing that we're all just trying to, to do the right thing, which is to be you know, family, and to be able to come together and do what's right. I think yeah. it just boils down to treat others the way that you want to be treated. And that goes to how you speak to someone and then also combating systematic racism and oppression. <laughs> like, it's levels to it. And it's realizing that we're all humans in this life and that we're humans on planet Earth and specifically in America that has, that has systems, American systems, such as like uh, the government systems and healthcare and education that perpetuate racist ideals. And that's really what it boils down to. And um, Joy, she touched on a point saying uh, at the Shelby Township uh, protest, counter protesters think that we're protesting America, that we're protesting their livelihood. Um, but it's, it's not that whatsoever. It's really protesting you know, these races, sexist ideals that uphold, that are deeply rooted in American culture. And it's uprooting all those things, all these racist practices that perpetuate these injustices. Um, So it's really making people take a step back and look at themselves and really see how am I playing a role? And people have said so many times, well, I'm not racist, I have a black friend. You know, like, I haven't called anyone an N-word. Like, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. And it's like, not about you. It's about the bigger picture of what we're all living in. It's uh, looking at your identity, looking at the intersectionality, love that, (laughs) of who you are, where you come from, your education, all that. And then the bigger bigger picture, the world that we live in and how it's made up and how it affects other people. And how are you playing your role 
in one being complacent are you being complacent or are you listening and also seeing how you can play a role in bringing justice to community beautifully said you know we i i have one more big question for you all which is how are we gonna you know start talking brass tacks and start working um together not just what can i do tomorrow but what can i do right now what can i do in, in the following days um i don't need it we I think it's so easy for us to also think about the grandiosity, like it has to be some big thing, otherwise we're not contributing and therefore it just gets, we get paralyzed and don't do something. Instead of what can I do tonight? And what can I do tomorrow? And then what can I do? I, I think you said that earlier, Rebecca, there's 24 hours of being able to do something, right? Um, so I wanna focus on that, uh, but I also wanna just uh, echo one more um, the teaching that we have in Judaism that I think uh, encapsulates a lot of what you all were just saying which is we have this concept called um, the idea of being created, but Salam Elohim, right? It's the idea of being created, everyone being in, created in God's image. Mm -hmm. That when God created the world, everyone was created in God's image. It's directly from the Torah, but Salam Elohim. And the question is, what does it mean to be created in God's image? And the answer is, you don't have to worry about what that means necessarily. You just have to take it as a given that people are created in God's image. And that means that there's a little bit of God in every single individual. And the way that you treat an individual means that's how you're treating God. And if you're okay with treating God in a way that's hateful and bigoted and coming from a place of fear or ignorance or, or anger, like you need to recognize what that, what that is doing to who you are as a person that, I mean, if that is if you have a relationship with God or if you're connected in, in, to religion in any way. Um, but as Jews, that's an important thing for us to think about every single day because that should that small little phrase should change the way that we have every single communication and every single conversation with anyone that we have. It's again, like you said, Rebecca, it's, it's loving people the way that you want to be loved, treating people the way you want to be treated, but going even a step further and saying, what if every single person that you were talking to has God in them? Like then that's not even just about you because some people also have some self-loathing of themselves, which I think also motivates some of the hatred that comes from people. Um, but if the person you're speaking to has God inside of them, what does that mean for how you're treating them? Right. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you all and you tell me and anyone else listening and anyone else watching, what can I do tonight? What can I do tomorrow? What can I do this weekend? What can I do in the weeks ahead, the months ahead? But, but let's start small and anything and everything. And I'll make sure that we put um, links in the chat um, that we, um, make sure that we continue our conversation, even if we're not on Zoom, that we can continue to talk via Instagram and Twitter and everything else too, and make sure that we're supporting one another. So I, I wanna have all those resources available, but you take it away. Um, tell me what, what we can do. Uh, just real quick, <laughs> not to do any free promo or anything, but I believe that our page is definitely a great um, resource to get involved. I know that um, Rebecca is in charge of our link tree, which has some amazing petitions in there, um, amazing ways to get involved. And she can speak more on that. Um, speaking to like Caitlin and um, Joy, um, I know that with their internship, they're actively always seeking to um, get people registered to vote through um, studentsvote.org. And then also like on our page, we have like a thread of like non optical allyship, which basically just calls for like allies, um, not to just like come to the protest and take a cute pic to be seen, you know, or not to just post a black screen on your page with the hashtag black lives matter and think that that's it. Like we're also kind of calling on you guys to donate um, making sure that like you're checking on your friends, your family, your community members and like um, as well as your black friends, family and community members and making sure that you're asking um, your black colleagues specifically what they need from you and how you can help in um, your own community or their community alike. And then I also would um, encourage for like um, to just think long term. Like I know that um, with social media and stuff, everything comes so fast and is gone within the next two weeks. But, you know, just to make sure that you don't kind of get that burnout inside and to just keep being an active activist. Yeah, I agree with all of those points. I also would say um, what you can do tonight or tomorrow is to keep having the conversations with your friends and your family members and your coworkers. Like, 
especially if you're in the education system, if you're in healthcare, if you're in the law enforcement even, if you see one of your coworkers or someone that you, you know, know, call them out if you know that they're doing something that isn't right, that isn't going to benefit this movement. Because I know a lot of officers, you know, that label themselves as good cops, but they see their, you know, fellow cop brother or sister doing things that will negatively affect the society's perception of them. So call out the people that you know aren't taking the steps and doing what they need to do in order to um, change the perception of those people, if you get what I'm saying. If you have people in your lives that are racist, if you have people in your lives that make ignorant comments or jokes because people love to hide behind the image of a joke, then, you know, say something about it. Don't just be a bystander in this. You can do your own sort of activism within mm -hmm. your small community that you're in. It doesn't have to be all out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, a, There you go, Joy. I was about to say. <laughs> oh, I was going to say something you can do today, tomorrow, all the way up until July 31st. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you can apply for an absentee ballot. That's what you can do. And you can also be ready to vote by mail. Um, you can also do some of your own voter education, um, doing your own research on these candidates, figuring out where your ideals align with these candidates, um, who will best serve you and your interest and what you want this future to look like. Voting is not the end all be all, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. So apply for that absentee ballot. Secret Secretary of State in Michigan. Wait, what was the what was the website that you talked about? Studentsvote.org. Studentvote.org is where you can get registered um, okay. to vote, and then the Michigan Secretary of State's office is where you can apply for an absentee ballot, so you can be able to vote by mail. Also, make sure to do your census. That is very important too. But uh, real quick, I know that we kind of got away from the Generation Z um, conversation, but um, we're all in the ACLU uh, 2020 National Advocacy Institute program. And they said something really interesting during the first day of the seminars. They were like, uh, Generation Z is so radical. Like, we won't pay our health bills, but we'll for sure like tip 20% at like any restaurant and make sure like all the dishes are collected up nicely so the waitress can get them. <laughs> and yeah, I just, I love that joke. I really do. Yeah. I'll share it anytime I can. <laughs> yeah, another one, it was like, um, they'll be scared to make their own dentist appointments, but they'll be able to like throw tear gas during a protest or something yeah. like that. <laughs> No, I think I think that those things. I mean, they're just a testament to the awesome work that you're doing. And um, and again, I, I want to highlight just how important this moment is because I think that the way that you're going about it, and that um, the great majority of people who are out there right now in the streets and online and and um, learning and listening and marching and doing all of these different things are, are all have the same goal of just doing it for the right reasons of being good, being kind and treating each other with dignity and respect and love. And that's what it's all about. So um, please come back anytime that you guys want to talk. Uh, it's been so great chatting with you. Uh, we'll make sure that we continue the conversation on, online as well. Um, so follow BAM on Instagram. Um, and the, the, say Rebecca. BAM Revolution, B A M N Revolution. Follow us. And on Facebook. Yeah. On Facebook, on Instagram, are you on Twitter too? We're not on Twitter, but we need to make us Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's a good place to start and we'll share of course we'll share all of your um, all of your stuff too and make sure that we're um, continuing this this partnership and this friendship it's been really really great so uh, wonderful meeting you all via zoom keep praying with your legs keep praying with your um, your posts quit keep praying with everything that you you continue to pray with you guys are doing amazing amazing work um, we are really really moved and really touched and really honored that we got to talk to you tonight Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely think that it's important that um, we bridge these um, kind of gaps between the Black community and the Jewish community. Because honestly, I feel like they really um, try to 
pit us together sometimes, especially like comparing tragedies, which we should never do. Yeah, they're so different. I think it's very like conversations like this are very productive, not only to see um, your perspective as a Jewish man, but our perspective as black women. So again, just thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Very, very honored. Um, and we'll talk soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so you much. Everyone. Thank you.